been on bell court i copied you in so the, the only reason i copied you you and the team in and not the pd is i thought it was going to be something like what we're talking about today i'm like that's why so but i <coughs> typically would have sent it to the pd chris i fill it in for rich it appears that way rich. looks like it Good thing you're here. I you're on the hook. Short straw again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the training I want to thank or Mike Sullivan. Yes. <clears throat> Ready. Go. Good. Okay. All right. Let's. Call the uh, Board of Public Works and Capital Assets meeting of March 14th to order. Roll call. Uh, Gail is here. Kuzikowski is here. Seaford here. Sigali here. Can you turn your mic? We're having some issues with the. Uh, Recording, so we just got to make sure we're make our mics on and we're talking into the mic. Approval of minutes for the uh, 212 23. Any changes or questions or comments? So, Gally moves to approve the minutes. Yeah, which is it? Uh, 212 or 214? 214. Right? All right. Seifert seconds. Roll call. Gill's aye. Kuzikowski aye. Tharnacki aye. Seifert aye. Kelly aye. All right. Already informational uh, review of Common Council actions related to the public works and capital assets. Is that you, Karen? Yep, that's me. Um, so we had quite a few exciting things. Um, become approved through council over the last couple of meetings um, so pretty importantly the plan of finance was approved um, so council approved the borrowing of 14.83 million for projects including the bluff st stabilization along Lake Michigan um, the North Bluff Park um, that's also north of Lake Vista Park on Lake Michigan and also replacing the stormwater lift station on Drexel Avenue along with some infrastructure improvements um, for the Lakeshore Commons development. So this debt will be paid um, via the tax in increment district number 13, and then also stormwater utility revenues. Um, so that was a big thing. Also, um, phase one of the Drexel streetscape was approved. Um, so that'll begin at um, South Ikea Way and extend eastbound toward the railroad tracks, but um, will be extended to Howell in the future. Um, also, the North Bluff Park plan um, was presented at, at the February 20th meeting. Um, just some feedback um, from a survey that elicited over um, 1,200 responses. So the park and amenities in the plan are then connected to the city's effort to stabilize that bluff um, north of Lake Vista Park. So work will begin in 2023, and then council can formally adopt the park plan in April or May. Um, also, the flock services agreement um, was approved by council. So that's um, an automatic license plate reader technology um, that can capture technology for up to 30 days via cameras. Um, the design phase of the roundabout for Putes, Liberty, and Wood Creek um, intersection was approved. Um, and then there was also a development agreement that was approved um, for Lakeshore Commons as well that'll provide um, TIF assistance to construct the 28 townhomes and 132 unit apartment building in the Lakeshore Commons neighborhood. So quite a few exciting things on the horizon. Thank you, Carly. Any questions or comments? You're there, right? Oh, yeah. Spending money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, mostly for the board members that uh, uh, aren't uh, on the common call, so in case they have questions. All righty. Um, move on number five. Consider a motion to approve progress payments number three and four, the PLC 
replacement. So this is yeah for our PLC replacement project. Uh, Next Electric is doing that work. They are finally on the site doing the work. We've been parts to see work. I say almost all parts. Had the wrong part. That, but they are progressing along. This is two payments. The total of the eighty-three thousand three hundred and fifty dollars. How long will it take for the parts that uh, we had to reorder? We're thinking uh, about three weeks. Okay. So hopefully it won't delay it too much. What we're concerned about is doing that work on the filter area during the summer. Yeah. So we want to really try and get that done. And the other flip side of that is we want to make sure Next Electric doesn't lose the project prior to getting those parts. So we're having them work on other categories. Okay. Uh, we're just a little nervous about that. Yeah. Okay. Makes sense. Thanks for the information. Uh, do we have to? Yeah, we've got to make a motion on this one here. Zarnecki will make a motion to approve progress payments number three and four for the PLC replacement project at the water treatment plant to Next Electric in the amount of $83,650. Seifert seconds. Roll call. Kelly. Yeah, Kuzikowski, aye. Zarnecki, aye. Seifert, aye. Kelly, yeah, aye. All righty. Uh, Consider a motion to approve utility vouchers for payment in the amount of six hundred sixty-five thousand one hundred sixty-six dollars and thirty-nine cents. Something special. Okay. Just had one quick question: the the Cedar Corp is that for inspection services for like that private development going on? Correct. Yes. Okay. Yeah, we use Cedar Corp. We've done some design work with them, but lately. Okay. And is that? Borne by the utility of the cost for that inspection, or is that passed along to the developer? Passed along to the developer okay. on development. Okay. Good question. And okay. motion. Seifert moves to approve the utility vouchers for payment in the amount of six hundred sixty-six thousand one hundred sixty-six dollars and thirty-nine cents. Fred, that was six six five. Six six five. Six six five. I'm sorry. Gill second. Roll call. Uh, Gill I. Kuzikowski I. Arnaki I. Saper I. I. All right. Informational administrative and operations reports. Well, I'll just have a couple things to kind of touch on on the engineering report, uh, the four steel matter water main. Project so Bev, Elbeth, and Griffin. That project is underway. Fred can give us a report on the status. What do you think, Fred? Fred? Sorry? How are they doing? And that water main project in front of you. Um, it takes about 20 minutes to get out of the subdivision. You've got to move trucks, cranes. And I understand they're right in front of your house today. Yeah, it's lovely. <laughs> they are making, uh, they are making fast progress. So and even when the city plows, they do a great job. They put it right in my driveway. And Time of year, yeah. yeah. Uh, so that one is underway. We're looking for Howell, and Howell Avenue to get going shortly, but we'll talk about that in the item coming up. On the distribution report, I just wanted to highlight the Edgewood School lateral work that was done there. It was presented as a leaking hydrant, so we went after repairing the hydrant. That did not cure the leak. We went, dug it down. It was 10 feet deep. For us, they got down to it. What they found out it was lateral coming off of what we would loosely call the hydrant leak going to the school. It's a three inch hard copper lateral. Uh, very strange for this day and age to have hard copper in there like that. So now what do we do? That was leaking the way that it was connected to the main. Very poor. We're not exactly sure when that was done. We don't have records of that work. So uh, regrouped. We also had a valve out in the street that isolated this area. That was leaking as well. So we took care of that on a Saturday. All of this was done. Uh, we hired a contractor to come back out again. 
a very large hole to make two hydrants put in and then reconnect back into the It was quite the operation. Unique repair done. That's a big one. Uh, you'll see a bunch of orange fencing around the school, around the hydrant there. It's very unusual. They have hard copper. You know, if you, you would have a, a more flexible, softer copper that typically would be out there for something like that, if it was copper at all. But to have this hard copper pipe was really, really strange. Talk to Jeff Lynch over here in plumbing to try and figure out what the best way to couple that back together was. Ended up using pro pro press. We ended up using a pro press coupling. Um, you take this copper coupling and you put it on, and you just clamp it down on there, and that was connection. Did some other creative work by then tapping a four-inch uh, cover, or cap, or end plate in order to, to connect into this three-inch. There just weren't pieces. We did what we could, but we have a much better situation. We've got some good four-inch valves in there. They're lateral compared to the hydrant main. Couldn't be done before. And we have a plan when the main gets replaced in Shepherd to run this lateral right off of the street and have it through into the main. Yeah, it was just a... So I got a bargain on three-inch copper that I summer? Or what? Yeah, probably done in the 60s. And then, unfortunately, so to go inside uh, to get at the meter... It's in a crawl space that you have to crawl about 100 feet under the school to get to this meter. It's, it's the whole thing is just yeah. But the school was fantastic. They worked with us, had their maintenance people out there both times we were doing the work. Did all the flushing on the inside. Ended up working well, but that was a tough repair. Very unusual. Sounds like it. Yeah. Uh, the other two things, just yeah, on a. On a feel-good right. side that I wanted to highlight is at the distribution conference for WWA, we had uh, Mark Kraber and Paul Craig were our hydrant engineering team. They were assembling a hydrant as fast as they could. They came in second place. Turns out the first place team can't go to the national conference to represent Wisconsin. So they were able to do that. I'm proud of them for that work. Ryan Mon was on the meter challenge last year. Thing he took second place. Milwaukee, first place in that, they're not able to go. Proud of those guys, and I think, yep, there's some pictures included in your report. On that first picture, Ryan is standing on the left <coughs> there, and on the second picture, the two guys on the left are Mark and Paul. Darren puts on, as the chair of the committee, puts on that whole uh, conference with the rest of the team. Proud of them for that. They had good attendance. Good. Uh, administrative wise, we're starting out the year uh, really well. You can see commercial is up, industrial is up uh, quite a bit. And a couple of notes on that uh, commercial is up due to the Aldi warehouse largely. Um, also, Hub 13 is, is up, but the Aldi warehouse is a little bit unusual. They've been doing some additional plumbing work in there, They've had their system down, dewatered, and then filled, and then watered again. So Used a fair amount of water there, but they had a lot of leaks. Largely their usages, so we expect that to go down. Uh, on the industrial side, uh, of course, we Energies is not up as much as they have been in the past, but they are still up. Uh, that's not unusual. Frotho Laundry is up. There. Only other item, which is really kind of a, well, it's not really small, it's a little bit smaller. And that is on the public authority side, USPS is up significantly. Um, and that's because they're solving a drainage problem within the building with their lines being plugged and getting clogged from bathrooms, which are on one end of the building, the lines are on far opposite end of the building. Called in rotor router a couple of times, so now the solution is let the water run. Good for sales. Uh, it's also really good to keep water fresh up in that upper chapel area. Is that on 10th or on 6th? That's the one up there on College and Pittsburgh. Oh, that one. Yeah, Sorry, the big I one. I forgot all about that one. Yeah. Well, yeah that is a big building. They're yeah. just letting it run. Uh, and plant-wise sort of echoes the sales as well, where the yearly pumpage is up, but again, starting out the year pretty well. Highlight on that. All I have.
Thank you. Any questions or comments? I guess I can offer a comment just to piggyback on what Sullivan said. I am affiliated with the Wisconsin section of AWWA, which is a lot of those events. <clears throat> I guess I just wanted to let the whole board know that um, the employees here in Oak Creek really do represent the community well. Uh, they're very well respected in, in the organization and throughout the industry. Um, Darren does a phenomenal job on the conference he runs. I also saw a presentation by Brian last week, um, and then they also acknowledged Sally, who Hiring Friday, I believe it is. Um, so again, for a community your size, you're very well represented, very well respected. That out there. Awesome. Good information. Anything else? All right. Hall <coughs> Avenue. Brian. Good morning. Um, so here to talk about Hall Avenue. Uh, this project will begin in the end of March, they'll start mobilizing. Traffic barrels will be set up, equipment moved in. Um, really starting to hit the ground in April. Uh, Oaks and Son is the contractor that's gonna be out here. They are uh, planning a very aggressive schedule with this. They're planning 11 hour days and working Saturdays to start with. So they're trying to get in here and get out here as fast as they can. Um, it is going to be a long disruptive process. We'll be down to one lane of traffic northbound on Howell from Groveland up to Drexel, which is going to snarl up traffic pretty well on Howell Avenue. Um, there was discussion at our pre-con meeting that we had last week. Um, we have night closures planned for Howell Avenue. Um, we have to get all the way across all three lanes of Howell Avenue, so we didn't want to close that during the day. And it's in the northbound lane. Northbound only, yes. Um, didn't want to close that completely during the day, so we plan night work. Um, Oaks is trying to come up with a plan to do this during the day and maneuver traffic around so that they can get the work done. So there might be a possibility we won't have our night closures or anything like that. Keep you posted on that. Uh, we do have a public information meeting that is scheduled for the 21st. It's gonna be in the multi-purpose room from five to seven. Way it's uh, interested in attending is available to um, all the aldermen were notified of that already. So, if you get any complaints or issues, concerns with the project, please have the residents call me. We can address those issues. And uh, Roblin to where? Drexel. Roblin, Drexel, northbound. We got plans for business driveways. As they'll be able to maintain them. Uh, the project itself, due to DOT standards, uh, we're going to be directional drilling the project. Um, so it won't be a big open cut. We'll have our bore pits, directional drill. Majority of it, there is some open cut work. And then we'll have to come back and open for each hydrant lead, each connection, open that up. So it was just a, a DOT requirement that they didn't want us to have it opened up for more than 72 hours without concrete barricades around it. They're going to repave. Next year, 25. 25, I thought yeah. Next that's, year. yeah, so that's part of this too, is trying to get in there before the state's in here to do their mill and overlay project. So, um, eastbound, Forest Hill will be closed off for a portion of the project. Oakfield, Groveland, Susan will all be closed off for a portion of the project as they're working through those. We're not gonna close down all of those side roads at the same time. So there will be a way to get in and out. Residents will be able to get in and out of their driveways, but there will be that work as we go through that intersection that will impact that access. Um, on top of this, we have the Forest Hill Manor project that we talked about that's on Third Ave Valdeth Griffin. That's just a couple blocks over off Groveland. Um, Susan be starting here in April so that's relaying Susan from Howell to Verdev that work will be going and tomorrow we have Forest Hill on the east side of Howell going out for bid that'll relay about uh, 600 feet east of Howell trying to incorporate that project the Forest Hill project into the Howell project as well so when Forest Hill is closed down they can work with that 
be ideal if Oaks was the winner of that project, but we'll let our bids come in and see what we can do. Any questions on the project? It, yes, it will be. We've seen, you know, Howell Avenue down to one lane and it it gets ugly quickly. So a lot of traffic out there. So hopefully people will be finding an alternate work route in and out. Um, the current schedule has us going through August. So for the better part of May to August is going to be one lane on Howell Northbound. We're hopefully more controlled and less disruptive than yeah. Growing up, quick barricades, water's flowing. Should be cold night. <laughs> now, is Groveland going to be one lane too, or is that going to be open? Groveland will be open. It will so, be open. Yeah. Um, it, it's wide enough. You can still get two lanes of traffic there. They're just doing a tie-in to the existing main on Groveland with the, the Howell Avenue project. They'll make that tie-in and, and start running north. The first stage of this is going to be doing the work at Forest Hill. It's a directional bore. We have to go underneath all the storm sewer, sanitary sewer. So we're taking our water main and going down 20 feet and going across Howell. And then they'll come back and start at Groveland and way north and tie back into that. Are you going to notify the people in the neighborhood? Yes, notice, notices went out last Friday of the, the public information meeting. Um, we notified everybody within 300 feet on either side of Howell, plus we included everybody west of Verdev from Groveland to Drexel. I'll uh, direct everybody to the public information meeting. Uh, it's been in the ACORN last fall. It'll be out again this spring in the ACORN. And we're working on getting it into the uh, Facebook social media pages as well. The neighbors did appreciate you notifying for the other project. Yep. Uh, we, we talked to probably 75% of them when we were out there and let them know the project's coming. And but Yeah, it's, it's making a mess out there too. There's a lot of activity. There's going to be more coming. There's two crews working on the, the Forest Hill Manor project right now. So one crew started on the north side, one started on the south side. Um, the drilling crew is coming in this week and start setting up. So there'll be a third crew out there. So it's getting a little congested in that neighborhood. No comment. <laughs> <laughs> um, I know every time I go out there, I seem to park in somebody's way. So. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. <coughs> uh, number nine, consider a motion to approve a placement of a temporary uh, parking signs. Hello, Chief. Good morning, Dave Stecker, Chief of Police. I'm coming forward today uh, trying to resolve an issue that's kind of been ongoing since we started the farmers markets and dealing with the traffic, the parking specifically on Town Square Way and Clock Tower Way or Road. And the reason for that is for farmers markets on Saturday mornings, they start at nine, they go until one. So they need to set up and get everything going. Right now, uh, it was previously approved for no parking temporarily on Saturday mornings, the duration of the farmers market from seven till one. Uh, with it being at 7 a.m., that means that someone can park there until seven, then we're gonna get somebody that calls, then we're gonna go there, and then ultimately, if we can't get a hold of anybody in a reasonable amount of time, we're gonna tow the vehicle, which really delays everything and then puts off trying to set up for the farmer's market. There was a request to have no parking actually from the night prior forward. Uh, we don't believe that that's probably the most reasonable thing to do for all of our businesses around here and uh, just the citizens to not be able to park from the night before. So we're looking to move it from 5 a.m. until 2 p.m. That gives us the full duration. It gives us a reasonable amount of time to set up for the farmer's market. It also gives us a reasonable amount of time to respond and try to get a hold of the vehicle owner before we have to tow the vehicle, should there be a problem. So trying to find the best balance of dealing with that so that we don't have those problems on Saturday mornings. David, can you uh, remind me that? 
clock tower and go so to east, west clock streets. tower is the one that's just out here and then uh the town square right way yes is the one that's just on the borders uh bel air and goes across to okay. uh gg's correct so it's the very short ones and that's where they have all the view uh well whether it's this or they have uh food trucks set up that's usually where they're setting up there People, I mean, we, they should be overnight parking to begin with. So it's, it's two hour parking on most of them, so they shouldn't be there to begin with, like what you said. But things do happen. We can and we try to anytime there uh, something's not an emergency to get a vehicle moved for towing purposes. Obviously, your registration we can just click on anywho.com, whitepages.com, and hopefully try to find a, a phone number. It's becoming a little bit more difficult now with people not having landlines and most cell phones not being listed on those. But if we do have contact in house, then we can look at what that phone number is that the last time we had contact with them. Try to get a hold of them and say, Hey, we need you to move your vehicle, otherwise, it's going to get towed. So we try to do our best anytime we have those situations to do that. Regularly, you're learning pretty fast, right? They're they're gonna know pretty fast as well, yes. <laughs> <coughs> I got no problem with that. Either. Bob, any? All right. Thank you. Motion, yeah. All right, Zarnick, you'll make a motion to approve the placement of temporary parking signs on West Clock Tower Place and West Town Square Way, restricting parking from 5 a.m. till 2 p.m. on Saturdays throughout the season while the farmer's market is held. Second. Roll call. Bill I. Krzykowski, aye. Zarnicki, aye. Seaford, aye. Sigali, aye. Number 10. Consider a motion to approve installation of no parking, stopping, or standing. I got this, Chris. All right. Um, so we were, the city was approached by the principal of Cedar Hills Elementary School requesting the proposed signs that are in front of you. Um, this stemmed from what they were witnessing, which was um, children crossing the road the parents waiting on the side for pickup and sometimes drop off, primarily pickup. Um, they were scheduled as walkers and they would just, parents would sit on one side of the road, pick it up mainly on the north side, and that was for, um, so they didn't have to wait in line, I guess, for the pickup. Um, we did receive or we sent out notices to um, residents within 300 feet of the impacted area. We did receive three comments, which were all opposed of the proposed signs. We have made uh, Principal Springer's aware of that. From um, the recent correspondence we received, um, she did go door to door or did reach out and, and spoke with the residents along that area trying to find some sort of compromise um, in the situation. Um, we did receive the email from her saying the school district would consider only 2.30 to 3.30, which is the pickup time, um, not drop off. They felt that this was where most of the issues were occurring. Um, engineering doesn't have either, I guess, issue with, with going to that time frame for stopping. Um, it would be kind of in conformance with what we have in some schools. We did, you know, uh, I believe Shepherd Hills, we have that same situation. The other schools, it actually is during drop off and pickups usually we have a seven to four time frame like we have proposed on the, on the agenda but um, we're open to compromise and, and discussion amongst the board here um, to come up with a solution I'm not sure I know if we have one person in the audience I'm not sure if they're here for this item or not um, they'd like to speak if you'd, if you'd allow them to that'd be appreciated but so I'm open for questions and, and discussion on this to try to find a solution I guess I can offer that my kids attend Shepherd Hills and they are posted for morning for an hour, I think 7.30 to 30 is the no parking signs. I haven't ever witnessed any issues with that kind of posted no parking. Um, so that's my 
opinion is that that might be a compromise that the president is a little bit more unopposed to this change. I'd opt for it. The principal is actually a little bit more worried yep. about the afternoon. I'd go as conservative as possible. Just happen over the afternoon. Tolerable. I mean, well said. School district problem. Their obligation is impacting them. I'll just other commentary. So, I don't see a problem. I, I agree that parking during the day creates a little traffic flow coming through that area. Uh, Sigali? I, I don't have an issue with Let's go for it. I'm just thinking even with the back of house. situation. <laughs> so, you know. Well, even as a parent, I mean, you remember this, you have a school district hasn't provided for a, a reasonable means to get your kids to the building. For their problem, it's their obligation to plan for that. Get some oh. crossing guards or something. I, I kind of look at it like the high school and And you'd always have the people, you know, stop halfway in the line, let their kids out here. Kids had to get, you know, the tuba out of the trunk and everything. And the rest of the line's still sitting there. There's no one telling them anything. No one cares. And I kind of look at the district pick up option for the kids. Where it's, you know, you line up and you have all the line. Okay, I'll pull them. Be well, it'd be for a couple minutes. No big deal. What's the chance that one of our officers is going to be that exact same thing? Stop them. Wait for my turn to run out. I'll do it. So, Say you know the minimum amount reasonable, but even at that, have a problem. I guess I. You know, I, I add to this conversation too. Is, and the school district does provide transportation to anybody that's not in that neighborhood. We got to remember that. So Cedar Hills neighborhood, which is pretty minimal as far as probably the number of students that attend that school, they are provided busing. So it's not like there is not a alternative. It's the choice of the parents. Um, you know, parents are going to make all kinds of choices all the time. Right, so I mean, so this is things th change, things it, deviate, doctor appointments. I understand that it is part of the school district so. issue, and it's also part of, I guess, the world we live upon now. That it, it's once again, it's the me. This is what I want. This is what's easier. This is what's better for little Tommy or, you know, Samantha. That you know they want to be on the bus because they get picked on a little bit here or there. Well, so, with that, right? So it's so I, I mean, it, it's the same thing, and I, you know, we were at that point too with. I raised my children here, but they went on a bus because that was the option that was provided, and it <laughs> to deal with it. So, I mean, and there are two there are two points of you know crossing that road, which are at intersections that are signed and marked and. That's where they should be crossing no matter what. So, I mean, if 
you know, in, in theory, if the children are truly crossing in the proper locations and they're getting in on a vehicle from the right side, which would be entering from a safe zone, safety-wise, if they're doing it properly and taught properly, then there shouldn't be an issue. If you want to look at it in, in that, that manner. But we all know. <laughs> Sir, are you here to speak about this or? Okay. So, I mean, it's it, it comes down to what are our intentions and and what are our expectations of, of parents and and also, you know, does the school district provide crossing cards? I don't. I would imagine they do, but I'm not. I'm not a hundred percent sure on which location they are. I know other school districts do, like Shepherd Hills has a program where they do have crossing guards. At, at their intersection to help the children across. So, you know, if those options are provided, then if it's done properly, it should be done safely. David, you can probably speak to how your office, buddy, with the contractor, they're regularly helping the residents. Sure. So, I wanted to take a moment, I think, to help clarify a couple of things. From the police department standpoint, I think there's a, a few things. The uh, least restrictive as possible is something that we would be in favor of something if we were going through. So the whole day, I think, is very restrictive. I think that we all know what the flow of schools, the drop-off times probably go very quickly. And so it's the staging that some of the parents will do waiting for that pickup time. And the earlier you get there, the closer you are to the front of the line. And that just trickles on. Every school has that issue. Um, I think the other thing that goes with it is we don't know who is supposed to be there or not be there. It's easier, I think, if someone's parking in that location that lives there and we can see they live on Sycamore or 22nd Street, they live right here. But if it's a visitor, if it's somebody doing uh, work, I think it's easy if they're in a construction style vehicle that we can obviously say it's the cable company, the phone company, it's a plumber. Those are pretty easy, but if it is a nondescript vehicle and somebody's doing something that we don't know any different until we start looking into it. Um, the other part would be the enforcement part. Like you said, we can have sign, sign everywhere a sign, but after a while those just dip off. So if we're gonna have something, we need to be able to enforce it as well because as soon as they see that it's not being enforced, they'll just continue the way that they are. So just something that we need to consider that we need to actually be able to have people there and that's going to be a priority for us to go and force crossing guard wise I'm not exactly sure what each school has I do know that the police department has not had crossing guards the city itself has not had crossing guards in well over 20 years and best I know is we're not trying to get back into that it's typically either volunteers or I believe some of the teachers take a rotation on making sure that people are crossing at the correct spot but any specific questions that you have from the police department, I'd be happy to answer as well. Well, the question I have is the enforcement. How do you guys actually enforce it? It's kind of difficult. Um, that That is going to be the difficult part. We are going to either have to be there and parking complaints in the whole, or when you're looking at that hierarchy of complaints and calls that we can go through, they're going to be towards the bottom. So if we have active things that are going on, bigger things that we need to deal with, we're going to be dealing with those. So we need somebody there basically stationed to watch and we can do that and we do from time to time when there's things that pop up. Uh, the problem is, is that if we're not there and this is a very small time frame that we're looking at, there's gonna be the complaint, we're gonna get a call, we're gonna respond and is that person still gonna be there by the time we get there? And I think that that's the hit and miss, part. correct. Cedar Hills isn't the only school that has a problem. I think the other schools have the same thing where people are backing up and picking up. Primarily, pickup time is the difficult time. Drop off isn't so much. Pickup is where we seem to get the big line problem. I think the coaches. Cedar, Cedar, or Cedar Hills, their drop-off is in the rear. 
No. They, they restaged that, restriped it. There's a two-lane drop-off. They do enter from the roadway at one stub. Um, so their, their staging, so to speak, would probably head down Sycamore to the west and enter in that way. Um, I haven't personally been out there to witness it. Then that probably heads down Sycamore <laughs> to the west, if anything. Did you? Did it happen on? What? Uh -huh. I mean, it, it does come down to exactly what Chief Stecker said too. It's, it's, how do they enforce it? You know, because this is typically done within, you know, pickups probably within 10, 15 minutes. It's not a. It's not a lengthy time, so enforcement is always a big issue when it comes to the signs in general. They have to be there to, to witness it and then to enforce it. So, you know, we, we don't want to impose additional tasks onto our, our department that's already tasked to their limits. So, you know, that need, needs to be taken into consideration. I think uh, with Alderman Gell, it's like more of a school problem, um, school district problem. I don't know. Fix it. Signs that you can't really uh, force. So just a reminder, when you do the motion, make sure your motion isn't positive, and then you do a negative vote if you're opposed to it. About make it, a make, it make it a positive motion oh, and just <laughs> nay it. You vote. Asagali moves to approve the recommendation. No, no, just give the motion and then we'll vote on it. Gotcha. Uh, Asagali moves to approve the Paper seconds. Why are we doing it that way? That doesn't make any sense. That's the that's the, that's the Robert's rules. But it doesn't get denied then. Unless you, you got a vote in the negative. That doesn't deny it. It just it just kills the motion. It kills the motion and it's done. What's left? I'm gonna city clerk. City clerk. Right. That's the way it's supposed to be done, and that's Ten the way uh, Melissa Carls, our city attorney, has instructed us to do it also. Uh, we've done this at other uh Meetings doesn't it doesn't get addressed, but proposal is denied. So do we have a second? Second, second roll call. Gill no. Kuzikowski no. Arnecki no. Super no. Kelly no. Adley no. <laughs> I'll move to adjourn. But you made the motion. <laughs> Second to adjourn. Roll call. Whatever it takes, right? Gail I. Who's it? Kowski I. Panaki I. Super and I. Sigali I.
just... Those they made in the... Counterintuitive. 